Guys, where's my stuff? I make content on the internet. I've never been on a TV show. What's up, folks? My name is Justin Connor. This is episode eight of The Bears Breakdown. But Carmen's dreams, man, just keep coming back with a vengeance. The fuck is going on? Anybody else wish they would have shown exactly how the heck that day ended from last episode? You hear me? Get the fuck off! Come on, you better in this place. You better. All right, let's do a quick cookbook pause here. So, yeah, a great mixture of fine dining and not fine dining, and and old too. So like old stuff and new stuff. So let's see. Lessons in Excellence by Charlie Trotter. Man, that is an old, old book. Some of the new ones, like Smoke and Pickles, Tartine Bread. Yeah, a couple different Tartine ones. This is like a really old one, the Escoffier book. Yeah, this is a good uh, library scene. And some Alice Water stuff over here. Yeah, this is SPQR way down here. Alain Ducasse. I saw the La Rue Gastronomie. Yeah, Milan Madison Park. A pied de cochon. Hopefully you caught in the first episode why I talk about chefs traveling around with their cookbooks and having them close by almost at all times. It's one of our few possessions early on in our careers. I knew which vegetables went together, proteins, temperature, sauces, all that shit. And when somebody new came into the restaurant to stage, I'd look at them like they were a competition, like I'm going to smoke this motherfucker. I felt like I could speak through the food, like I could communicate through creativity it was such a twang, man. Like, this was the first twang. I, I mentioned in the first episode that, uh, the first video breakdown, that I cried at the end of this, and this is like the first twang in my heartstrings that I felt in this episode. Because it's so true. Like, me sacrificing a lot of stuff early on in my career so I could just be a frickin' savage in the kitchen, and like, just wanting to hear good job from someone. I don't know where that comes from. It's like, the, again, that crippling insecurity that I talked about. And to it sometimes never comes from, especially from the people that you want it from the most. And so to hear him talk about this, so super accurate for me, I at least. I can, I'm not going to speak for everybody, but for me. Chef, yo, let's bring it in for pre-service, please. Yes, yeah, Chef. Right, everybody, come on out. Uh, okay. Look, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we are going to be closed for dinner service tonight because we are having a bachelor party in the front. Oh, fuck that! Why? I know, I know. It's Cicero's friends, so. Yo, cousin. That sucks, Jeff. I was just getting into the zone. No, I know. I get it. But uh, it's just for the night. It's not that this doesn't happen. It's that you would have been told about this the day before because being able to come in and understand that there's a buyout happening at the restaurant is well, like one of the coolest days because it's like you know exactly how many people you're prepping for you know exactly what's going to be ordered you know exactly what time they're coming in and it's not like sir you're serving people from five o'clock to ten o'clock you're serving everybody at seven and so you can kind of like be set up a little bit earlier maybe people will come in a little bit later that day because you know that this is the only one party that's going to be here once certain dishes go out you can start to break stations down and so everybody gets out a little bit earlier that day buyouts are kind of awesome and the fact that carmen would not tell people until now is kind of weird lunch, and not right? super accurate i'll run point out front tonight in case i got to use the big boy voice i think we'll be fine thank you well you can never tell with these white collar criminals yeah Different people have different ways of blowing off steam. For for me, cooking at home, especially like trying to recreate something more fine dining y was like the last thing that I wanted. I would often gravitate towards like going to like a really greasy taco truck, right? Or like going to get a burger or going to, you know, spend time at a at a at a cool like cider producer, you know, that was just like as far away from fine dining food as I could get when I would get in the the headspace that these two are in right now. But again, people process different their emotions in different ways. And for Sydney being able to like finally feel like she could cook what she wanted to cook is probably what she's feeling right now. And so to be able to execute that, especially without the criticism of someone like Carmen or any of the other people at the restaurant and just being able to talk to somebody like Marcus, who clearly appreciates creativity and food, was probably really therapeutic for her. So this makes sense. Okay, so we have shallots, I, uh, tomatoes, herbs, and olive oil. Like, this looks like a scallion. Yeah, delicious. I feel kind of bad because I 
feel like it, it would be weird to work in a restaurant and not completely lose your mind. Big facts. So what is this? This is a Chilean sea bass. We got a little Alain Passard inspired uh, tomato confit. So Alain Passard, classic vegetable focused French chef. And so he has a couple books out that talk about vegetable cookery. And yeah, he's known for just being very simple with his vegetables and doing nothing crazy fancy with them, but still having, getting great product and just treating it simply. And that's who she's talking about. And and we'll link it down in the show notes if you want to check out any of his books. uh, I don't know, herbs, because fuck it. No, why the fuck not? Okay, Dill, that's what parsley. I'm yeah. So, have you like Dylan Parsley and all these people that you studied? I felt like the biggest. All right, this is where this dish like completely breaks down for me because the amount of oil that was already in the bottom of this bowl, and now she's drizzling more and like really drizzling it, and just watch how far she drizzles it. Idiot on the planet. Drizzle, drizzle, I didn't know drizzle, 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 drizzle. Half of the people that drizzle, anyone drizzle. was talking about. I spent okay, every single too. dollar I had, every last penny, just eating. Every single place that I could think of. And Eat to learn. One of those places was the best meal I ever had. Really it's a good spoon. Good. She's got a good spoon there. Thank you. Well, so what'd you think? It was, it was really good. It was really really good i think that's a point that you see mentioned multiple times throughout this show is how food gets described to one another so talking about things just being good is something that when sydney's tasting mashed potatoes from somebody or marcus is tasting someone for something from carmen it just it, you just want it to be good and 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 that's for a lot of us that's that's like enough and then you have other moments like sydney getting the feedback from carmen that her dish is tremendous or incredible or delicious and i think that for a lot of us is 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 that's the good job that we're looking for sometimes that's another reason why i want you folks to get better at talking about food sometimes is because it gives you the ability to talk about what is good in your coworkers' execution, what you're proud of about a certain dish. And just being able to say that something's good sometimes doesn't feel the best. <laughs> like, it's like, I, I wish there was more to the feedback that I'm getting on this component or the way that I executed this or the temperature that I was able to nail on this protein. And to just say that things are really good is like, it's a blanket statement and it means a lot coming from someone working in the industry because... If it's not good, you're going to say it's not good or it's a little bit off or whatever. But maybe that would help folks. Then that's that's kind of where it comes from for me is just wanting to be able to say, yeah, that's just good. Like, but, but being able to say the way that you cooked that fish and the way that it flaked apart and the way that the tomatoes were still plump, but just a little bit dehydrated and roasted and the amount of acidity coming from the lemon and the way that it played off of the dill in the dish that you kind of tweezed onto the top was really really good and to be able to talk about that is sometimes more impactful than just saying something is good i hope that makes sense so what was the best one best what best meal you ever had yeah it was it was carnies i knew it the truth comes out (laughs) got him in happy you're back all right chef your boy's back A souvenir for your troubles. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, That's how you can tell it's a Burgard apron. You, a the tag man. is out on his apron. <laughs> if you're enjoying this so far, I would really appreciate a like on this video. It does a little fun confetti thing when you hit it. And also subscribing to this channel makes sure that the YouTube algorithm knows that more folks want to see content like this. It helps me continue to produce content like this for you folks. And I would just really appreciate a gentle tap of that button. Let's get back to it. 
in restaurants, you clean deeper than any other place in your life, scrubbing down the doors, the sides, the handles of just a fridge unit takes time, but it's something that you'll do multiple times throughout your week. Different places have different standards to this. Sometimes you'll do it twice a day. Sometimes you'll do it uh, once a week. Sometimes you'll do it, you know, on the day that you walk in and then the, you know, like in the middle of your week, maybe and then the day before you go to your weekend. But it just makes everything other cleaning project in your life because in, in, in no other area of your life do you clean things this thoroughly. But again, it happens multiple times at restaurants. We're still going to get a lunch rush, so I want the front of house locked and loaded, please, all right? Yes, sir. Thank you. This is super common. I don't even know if I've talked about this in these breakdowns before, but a lot of us have these little tiny pocket notebooks where we'll keep our recipes, notes, ideas, processes, lists that we need to keep in mind, uh, instructions on how appliances work sometimes. any And, and I'm a big fan of having this because it, it, it multiple things. It can sometimes help you if you can't seem to rack your memory on the risotto recipe that someone gave you three months ago. And and sometimes when seasonal things happen, you haven't touched something for 10 months. And so being able to have it close by and handy is really helpful versus like if you have a bigger, like a moleskin notebook and you keep it at home, it's not as useful as having in your back pocket. Secondly, there have been studies that show that when you're learning something for the first time or trying to remember something or really internalize it, writing it down pen and paper actually helps you memorize it better or really kind of wrap your head around it. And so the ability to just pull out your notebook and take notes on what someone's describing to you can be really, really helpful for making sure that you can execute it without that person being there in the future. And so being able to have something like this in your back pocket is something that I really, really recommend. There's a whole video that I did on the channel talking about why it's important to have a notebook, not just on your first day, but just as part of your workflow. I use ones from a brand called Write in the Rain, which are waterproof, which is really helpful because if you were to drop something like this in a in the dish pit or drop it in a stock pot full of stock, it, it probably wouldn't come out all that good. And so being able to have little notebooks like this is helpful. That's why we use them. Yo, 200 pounds? Great, yeah, thank you. Come in full oh, circle. No, no, this is, uh, that's pork, I don't need pork. I'm just the delivery guy. Take it up a loop. <laughs> <laughs> full circle. Delivering pork to the beef restaurant. No more beef. Obviously, that's bad. But number two, whoever just came in here and just grabbed the last beef container out without taking this and one, taking off the foil and number two, just not getting rid of the hotel pan that it's in. Total red flag. Not not good. Not good behavior. Just chaos. On all fronts, the food chaos, the administrative chaos, the human chaos. Again, this like fire CGI. Why is it so bad? This is so bad. Why does that look so bad? I'll compliment what I compliment because I get to roast what I want to roast in this uh, breakdown series. Whoever did the fire effects, not great. See, talking about food. You say it's tremendous, but you say it needs something. As much as it sucks that there's still poor behavior from chefs just throughout the industry in general, what I, I am a fan of is like the accepted culture of apologizing more. Like there's a lot of people I've worked with who you couldn't in a million years imagine them apologizing for shitty behavior, but it happens a lot more than I would have thought. And so it's kind of like one step at a time. We'll get there. That's better. Again, pastry chefs, tell me in the comments. But man, that looks way delicious compared to whatever icing he was using before. Okay, chefs do some weird stuff. I can't say that I know of a story where I can remember people 
hiding stacks of cash in canned vegetable or in weird produce locations. But if this, you know, they needed to add this to the story in some way, shape or form so that there was a through line. And so I think it was a cool just kind of element. I'm not going to maybe speak on the accuracy of it because they needed to find a way to get Carmen a bunch of money at the end of the show. And to also tie it in with his brother and his just kind of like weird secretive nature. And I, you know, like, for is it all that realistic? No. Did I think that it, it was in line with the show and it was something that could be reasonably believable? Yes. And so, you know, this is the kind of like punchline to the end of the show. There's still another point at the end that I'm really excited to talk with you folks about. But this is a cool moment. Cousin! Yo. It's also such a restaurant industry thing where it's like we have a ton of money, but like people, you know, don't care about the money. They just want to help. I don't know. None, I don't think any of us are really like in it for the money. Sid, quit fucking around. Grab a can opener. Family style? Danish design. Tasty menu at the bar. Window on the side. For sandwiches. Yeah. This is the part where I definitely got emotional the first time I watched this show. And I think it's because you spend all this time learning and all this time sacrificing and all this time scheming and getting told no to finally think about being able to have the resources to start your own concept. And when that's finally a possibility, it's just like, of course, that's what we would do. Of course, that's what we would drive forward. Of course, I'm excited about this. Of course, it's not something where you get a bunch of money and it's like, okay, let's finally get off this train and go do something else. It's like, no, now finally we can do what we want to be doing. And so I, I resonate with this a lot, talking about Danish design, talking about wanting to do a tasting menu, talking about wanting to do something that appeals to the casual folks with sandwiches out of a window. There's a lot here that I think a lot of people insert your version of what it is that you want to do. And the scene resonates for a reason. Okay. This is also often how it happens. The, sh the, the person who is in charge of coming up with the idea or has access to the capital or has the reputation that's going to be put behind is going to be the face of the, the operation calls up the, the old people from their past and says, hey, this is what I want to do. Are you in? And Sydney's example, she says, I'm in. It's also there's something about saying goodbye to a kitchen that is weirdly emotional. It's like you spend so much time at a place. But for what it's worth, seeing this sign, seeing their excitement level, seeing how good they did this first show, it makes me all that more hyped for season two because this is what's coming next. It's been a joy to break down this first season with you folks. Thank you for your patience as I covered this show from start to finish. I hope that the way that I broke it down was at least insightful for those that didn't understand certain elements or wanted a bit of a deeper dive into the show. Um, huge props to the actors, the producers, the technical consultants, the camera operators, everybody that's involved with bringing the show to life because especially in a time coming out of COVID, a lot of people felt really tired, I think, coming out of the last two years. And seeing how this show got a response on social media just across the world, I feel like it like weirdly brought all of us together. And so that's why it was really cool to be able to see this unencumbered, like just as me watching it, and then watching it with you folks in this way. My name is Justin Kana. Thank you again, as always, for your attention. I'm really excited to talk to you folks in a future video. If you have questions for me, you want to check out the industry podcast, you want to check out my course, you want to check out gear reviews that I have on the channel, you want to check out the Repertoire Pro community, if, again, that coming togetherness and being able to talk with other industry folks is attractive to you, you can check all of that out inside the description. I hope you have a good one.